So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Peter Kramer up, and he's going to tell us some more stories. There's a picture of Les right here. This is a little daunting. Uh, can you hear me? So I spoke at Les's uh, memorial service, and I don't think anyone could hear me. Uh, I could give that same talk again, and I, I would have said I was anxious, but I, sitting here today, I think it, it's a less specific feeling. I find this meeting very moving in a, in a way that I suppose could be explained, but the affect is not corralled, uh, you know, in the way that something like anxiety uh, indicates. Uh, I think just this demonstration we've been given of the arc from Harry Stack Sullivan through Les and uh, Otto Will and uh, Bob Michaels and uh, Jennifer Havens, you know, it's just terrific to sort of stand in somewhere in that arc uh, and hear about Les's part in it. So I'm a writer, I'm gonna read this. If you can't hear, you know, motion or yell. Um, Leston Havens has been with me for the whole of my career. I met him early in medical school in the core psychiatry rotation, this is the early 70s, at Massachusetts Mental Health Center, where I got to see him conduct his justly famous interviews. You've seen a bit of one with patients. Soon after, he agreed to supervise me, as with Steve, in an independent study. We walked the fans discussing psychotherapy texts of his choosing. He became an informal advisor, encouraging me in my writing and helping me shape its direction. We became friends. We visited one another's homes and took walks together in Cambridge and far afield. Although a hierarchy persisted, I turned to less for advice and not the reverse. We were master and acolyte. I, th I sought wisdom. Les had his characteristic way of giving it. In 1998, we found ourselves walking in old Montreal on a morning after a rainstorm. I made an incidental complaint about my mother, who even in those years, and I was nearing 40, was capable of astonishing me, uh, often on the downside. <laughs> uh, Les and I approached a large puddle. He said, I wonder what Sir Walter Raleigh's mother was like. A non sequitur and a provocative one. I took less to mean that I should be beyond the point of bemoaning my mother <laughs> and her behavior. He was suggesting that imperfect mothering might foster grace, boldness, and ambition. Perhaps Les was saying that there were eras before Freud when mothering was considered less consequential. Les was pulling me up short. I took Les's comment to be psychotherapeutic. It acted as an existential intervention. I benefited from it. I remember it 30 years later. Even at the time, I thought, how does he do it? That question in broader form has been with me for the whole of my career. I can say as much because I've just closed my psychiatric practice, which means that likely I'm done with the practice of psychotherapy. This transition is a wrenching one, at least it has proved so for me. Much of the turmoil had to do with my patient's response to my announcement. I had anticipated agitation, but not at the level of what emerged. The transition had a second unexpected aspect. I began to question my work, and in particular, whether I had done the thing at all, that is, done psychotherapy. Among the patients I was saying goodbye to was a professional who had been referred decades back for care by his guild organization because of disturbing narcissistic behavior in the workplace. I had seen him for medication, while he had flourished under the care of another therapist, a social worker. The social worker had confronted him about his choices and beliefs. She had a genius for identifying subtle indicators of resistance. Nothing escaped her. In time, this patient became considerate and generous, and the happier for it, the contrast was extraordinary. He was a prince. As we said goodbye, I asked myself whether, through the, pra through the practice of therapy, I had ever achieved anything equivalent the transformation of character. I'd help patients wrestle with depression and anxiety and issues of identity and worth, but examples of thorough personality change had eluded me. This disappointment was paired with that second doubt about whether I'd ever done psychotherapy. 
I had arrived at medical school with an image of psychotherapy based on my experience on the analytic couch. The patient enters a trance from which new and sometimes distorted memories and insights emerge. The doctor, in a parallel trance, provides annotations that prove fruitfully disturbing and so on. Les's method was different, but it too included a hypnotic induction and it extended to his contact with trainees. Another word about Les as a mentor. At first, I found this form of interaction off-putting. When Les interviewed me for the independent study, midway through the conversation, I raised an objection. I was applying as a student and a future colleague. He was treating me like a patient. I didn't want to share intimacies. I didn't want to be moved to tears. Les liked pushback. I suspect that my interruption sealed the deal, but it didn't change his ways. It was I who changed in my attitude. I came to look forward to the therapeutic style interpretations, which Les might deliver at any moment. The title of the independent study was How People Change. I took it from Alan Wheelis's account of his interaction in boyhood with his dying father. You have to imagine a father you know, on the couch, dying in public uh, with the sun outdoors. Because he believed life was hard, the father had assigned Wheelis as a boy to cut the lawn with a razor blade and keep, it, keep at it every day of a long summer. The cruel life-shaping assignment spoke to influences outside the psychoanalytic model of interpretation of unconscious dynamics of mind. And I think, by the way, this was part of Les's genius. Approaches to the mind is terrific in its account of different schools, but I think its main function operationally in the profession was to tell people that psychiatry was not a hub and spokes arrangement with Freud at the center. It was some long legacy or arc in which Freud was merely one of, of many people, and that was what was revolutionary about it. I proposed the transgressive topic out of frustration with the teaching of classical psychoanalysis. Repeatedly, I'd asked professors how it was done. As a trainee, I was treating patients with dynamic therapy, and no one would tell me the rules. When a patient makes a statement that can send me in three directions, which path should I choose? When is silence best? The only directive I was able to extract was interpret character before content. And that was a crystallization of Wilhelm Reich's methods, which Freud had opposed. That psychoanalysis could be learned only through apprenticeship made it different from other academic or medical pursuits. If authorities couldn't distill the procedures and their rationale, wasn't the discipline more like a cult? I don't mean that I expected to be able to perform without doing any more than I imagined I could ski without heading to the slopes. But as a beginning skier, I could and did read instruction manuals. I turned to Les in part because of his revolutionary book, Approaches to the Mind, which I mentioned. At Les's suggestion, I read books that gave concrete advice about confrontation in psychoanalysis, the role in therapy of research into one's own personal history, and so on, all from books outside the mainstream. In the long term, the independent study began me on a career as a collector of alternative psychotherapies. They provide the basis of my book, Should You Leave, which also contains a tribute to Les. They informed my teaching in the basic psychotherapy course at Brown, uh, where I taught for decades. Uh, for readings, I assigned vignettes that illustrated techniques and then asked students uh, to reason back to the underlying theories of mind, and more or less in the way Alex did with movie clips. In other words, for years on my own, I continued the study uh, that I'd begun with less, how people change. In the short term, nothing revealed what I hoped to learn, how the magic is accomplished. And now I had a second source of frustration, how did Les achieve his magic? I read his books and monographs for answers and continued to do so later. In his 1986 book, Making Contact, I found the sort of guide I've been seeking in medical school. It reveals the technical secrets of existential psychotherapy. It shows how it's done. I want to point to two elements. The one that Les emphasized most often is empathy, achieved through the existential posture. Famously, he said, we all stare forth from an individually shaped and genetically different nervous system onto a world seen from this time and place by no one else. The therapist sits beside the patient imaginatively and experiences the world as the patient does. Sometimes empathy carries the whole load. Les wrote, often if the patient of a depressed, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, often if the therapist of a depressed person feels depressed himself, the patient improves. Many of Les's techniques grew out of this empathetic posture. 
He spoke in patients' voices, often through exclamations. Some are adjectival, emotive, and directly empathetic. How awful. Some are more complex. In response to a patient's, I'm sorry, in response to a paranoid patient's recitation of injuries, Les might respond, the bastards. Uh, Les calls these exclamations not intrinsically empathic, but they occur in the service of the empathetic effort. More commonly, the empathetic vantage is not curative in itself, but it shapes the therapy. With patients whose parents have been too present in their childhood lives, Les operates in near silence. The most delicate cases involve central concerns of Les's, mental trespass and psychological possession. The therapist takes care not to impose his will since he's treating a disorder of the will. Even when invited to do so, the therapist must avoid taking control and substituting his authority for the enslavers. Trespass can be insidious. Um, Les writes of beautiful women of regal bearing whose lack of self-possession is deeply hidden. He sits beside one such patient and looks out with her at a supposed Prince Charming. Imitating and amplifying her inner voice, Les says, I hope he's worth your while. Les's sitting beside the patient included awareness of how close to place himself, near to the self-loathing patient in need of reassurance, at a respectful distance from the paranoid patient. Les had a genius for gauging and modulating social distance. In this regard, I think he attended also to his own freedom. That is to say, empathy cannot define the whole of the method. When I complained about my mother, Les did not respond, the bitch. Instead, he produced a disruptive remark entirely of his own devising. Sir Walter Raleigh's mother came from Les. I'd never before wondered about her or about the mother of any Elizabethan save Elizabeth herself. I do think it's worth thinking about what, how you get such an extraordinary figure raised by a father who had killed the mother. Uh, anyway, uh, where did such devastating thoughts emerge from? We might say from the existentialist unconscious. This explanation does not do them justice. They relate also to what I consider the least appreciated aspect of Les's work. I'm thinking of his admiration for Harry Stack Sullivan and Les's astonishing discovery, I call it a discovery, that at the heart of Sullivan's approach is a particular posture, the one that Les called counterprojective. When patients imposed expectations on Sullivan, he blocked them emphatically. We see this method in the response to expectations of possession. When the regal patient offers to let Les substitute his will for hers, he declines to her surprise. I think also we see it in the Sir Walter Raleigh quip. It's close to what Les calls a counter-assumptive statement. I had invited Les to conspire with me against my mother, he demurred. This tendency was automatic for Les. He experienced an invitation to collude as a form of possession of him. He would not be co-opted. To speak in psychoanalytic terms, he had a profound mistrust of projective identification. <clears throat> we can talk about that later. He had made himself immune to it. Empathy notwithstanding, his constant message was, I am my own person. It followed that you could be your own person as well. His confrontation served as an invitation to join him in freedom. I have alluded to myself questioning at the end of my career as a clinician. I found my methods prosaic. My interactions with patients resembled everyday conversations. In part, I was following the model of another existential psychiatrist, one I also had discussed with Les, Helmut Kaiser, who complained that an obviously therapeutic stance creates distance. He wants you as a doctor to take in what a patient says as you would take in the question of your neighbor when he asks whether your electricity was cut off too. <laughs> but it was also that I could not pull off other methods. Oh, now and then I could produce an exclamation as Les did, magnifying a point that a patient had made. By crowding the bench from which we looked outward, I might nudge a patient into a new position. Now and then I'd see that a patient was so disorganized that I needed to speak to someone who almost existed, a patient in potential. I'm thinking of Les's metaphor of creating a provisional government so as to have a party to negotiate with. But I never achieved Les's skill at producing unsettling remarks. <laughs> well, no one did. It's that I was far off. What, it, what had happened to the techniques I gathered? I gained perspective from a gratifying moment that arose almost arbitrarily in the course of my shutting up shop. This was like a 
angelic apparition, I think. I received a phone call from a patient I had not seen for years. He'd hit a bump in his career path. His wife worried that he might be showing signs of depression. My patient, a college president, had lost a power struggle with trustees and been dismissed. I assessed his emotional state. He'd held off on job searches, preferring an interval of reading at home and dog walking. He seemed to be wrestling with a Les Havens problem. problem. What's for me? That was a favorite Les f phrase about what we're looking for from therapy. What's for me? My patient might value administration. He might return to being a scholar. He might take time off to write a non-academic book. I asked him how worried I should be. He said, you, uh, oh, this is good. He said, you weren't worried when I was living in my car. <laughs> he reminded me that when he first consulted me 25 years prior, he'd been homeless. He carried a diagnosis of schizophrenia. His prior doctor had told him to expect to be on antipsychotics for the rest of his life. A relative had begged me to take him on. Because of listening to Prozac, this prospective patient associated me with, that's a book I've written, with medication, and he had not wanted to resume medication. I had said that I would try to respect his judgment. I treated him with psychotherapy only. This patient did not achieve character transformation, but it was hard for me to deny that our work together had been a success. How strange. I had not forgotten this patient, but my memories were of the missteps I'd made in the treatment. I'd forgotten the context, forgotten the dramatic arc of my patient's progress. I tried to make sense of the therapy, what had been its dynamic. To begin with, I had not seen the schizophrenia. It was in my blind spot, a blind spot for diagnosis that Les had encouraged me to preserve. I listened to my patient's account of his circumstances. I understood matters as he did. He was put upon. He had unrecognized strengths. I liked how this patient related to me, enjoyed the conversations. I don't think that I tried to do much. I watched him work his way out of trouble. Perhaps challenging or clever lines, interpretations, or confrontations did come to me. I didn't use them. Less one said that when a therapist feels he must say something, he shouldn't, because therapy must be free and so cannot arise from compulsion. I had internalized that paradoxical lesson. I said nothing disruptive and went light on empathic exclamations, and yet I think the therapy had Les's fingerprints all over it. You absorb your mentor's teaching, and they act through you. I chatted with my patient in matter-of-fact fashion, your phone too, but respectfully with attention to distance. I don't want to take myself off the hook. If I made few grave mistakes of commission, still as a therapist, I missed opportunities. Constantly, I was aware of what else I might do, which of the techniques I finally had learned from less than others I might employ. I entertained multiple possible interventions and then held back. Perhaps that dialectic is evident to patients. If I ever do get myself off the hook, the resolution will be along those lines. When painters build up canvases, sometimes hidden layers th show through in the final work. Was the freedom implicit in Les's approach nonetheless evident in the controlled treatments I undertook? An open question and one that I'll explore at my leisure. So I'm going to stop and interrupt there. At the end of the memorial talk, I gathered some sentences from Les, and I don't think anyone heard them, and I'd like if there's still time to read them except that I've inserted one quote from Joseph Conrad, uh, which I will not identify, the, a quote that Les liked. So see, see what you think. I can, I'm sorry. I can walk on your land if I secure your permission and practice respect of its contents. These simple rules do not now obtain between minds. To find another, you must enter that person's world. The empathic visitor then discovers what he has taken for granted in his world, that it is a world of particular time and space. Few men realize that their life, the very essence of their character, their capabilities and their audacities, are only the expression of their belief in the safety of their surroundings. Much is outrageous and potentially violent in any point of view that attempts to be more than just one of many perspectives on a mysterious and largely invisible world. I judge that the success of psychotherapy in two ways. Does the patient's appearance change? Does he get new friends? We need someone enough like us to share our feelings and sufferings and different enough to have a separate perspective. It's like going on a picnic 
You want someone else along, but not a bear or a lizard. <laughs> How do you give someone freedom? Don't they have to take it? Don't they have to wrest it away? Set yourself not to possess or abuse or escape another human being, and you see quickly the thin curtain separating our hope of civilization from the savage practices of slavery and cannibalism. Reference once before also. In a difficult time of my own, I coined a saying, the unexpected is the only thing that happens. It is a paradoxical source of tranquility to know that we live close to failure and death. And let's stop with this one. The means I offer are directed against absence, isolation, submission, and domination. They are a means by which human presence is discovered and defined and a weapon in the constant struggle for existence. There we are.